thanks for the invite. Um, it's great to be in out of the blizzard of London into Brighton um, on a sunny spring day, perhaps. Um, so what I wanted to do tonight was, uh, I guess we're so sick of sitting in these dark rooms looking at designers flip through PowerPoints and talking about their projects. I wanted to tell a story, I suppose, a story about a city. Um, a city that we all inhabit every day of our lives, but, but a city that perhaps we're not entirely familiar with, or we don't understand the full complexity of. Um, so it really comes out of an interest in mine, of mine in what, what the city is, or how the city is different in an anthropocenic world, a world where technology is the driving force shaping landscape, um, shaping the planet. Um, and this interest has developed into Tomorrow's Lips of Day, uh, um, an architectural and urban think tank I run, and also unknown fields, as, as Hannah mentioned. So um, I'll try and paint this picture for you and, and take you on this rather sprawling journey of this new urban landscape. Um, but before I do that, a little prologue, just to, just to set things up a little bit. Um, so as, as Hannah mentioned, I run um, Tomorrow's Lips of Day. It's a, as I said, it's an urban think tank. And we're really interested in the history of futurology, exploring the fantastic perverse visions of yesterday's tomorrow, not, not for the accuracy of their predictions, but rather for the critical engagement they offer with the changing spaces of the everyday. So we borrow from tools of speculative scenarios, we deploy narrative and the illustration of fiction as imaginative tools to explore the implications and consequences of emerging trends, um, technologies and ecological conditions. So really what Tomorrow's Lots Today is trying to do is explore the, the idea of a think tank, I guess, as a, as a legitimate model for architectural practice, a practice not built on buildings as endpoints, but on speculations as products in themselves. Um, so as a, as a kind of a way of describing that, uh, I thought I'd start, before we get into the story, with a little description of a project um, that's in progress. It's called Under Tomorrow's Sky. It's a fictional future city, an island, emerging out of the tidal currents of the Persian Gulf, flanked in the distance by the dusty oil drilling ghost towns and wreckage of Iranian states. And there's a project that I developed with another think tank, a, people of, uh, a group of people I assembled, um, a think tank of mad scientists, literary astronauts, digital poets, speculative gamers, visionaries, luminaries, including people like um, science fiction author and futurist Bruce Sterling, comic author Warren Ellis, um, scientist Rachel Armstrong, Microsoft Research Building World, New Scientist Magazine, all these sort of people. And we came together to um, debate the social, cultural, ethical and environmental consequences of emerging technologies. Um, and we worked with concept artists from film and game design and we gave these conversations about an imaginary city or at least the city became a placeholder through which to play out these conversations of emerging research. And we gave it a material form a geography, a physicality, an image that would distill all of this research we were discussing into a form that an audience could connect with. Um, we worked with then special effects artists from films like Alien, Sunshine, Blade Runner, um, and uh, the architects from our, own, from our own group to build this um, room-sized movie mo miniature model of the city. So we, we took these guys out that, that, that are now kind of photographing birds and, and a semi-retired CGI industry has displaced them. Um, to, to give them one more project to start to play with and to develop um, this model of the city. And then across the course of the exhibition, um, we invited a series of authors and illustrators and filmmakers to inhabit this scale city as a stage set and develop a collection of characters, narratives, films and illustrations. Uh, we're now developing a, a, a book of fictions um, with a number of uh, really amazing authors who are telling stories set in this landscape to flesh out not just what the city looks like, but an idea about how the city feels and the cultures that it generates. To this, this old tradition of world building, I suppose, is really of interest for us in terms of how we can start to connect an audience to um, the futures that are really changing and shaping their city. So for us, Under Tomorrow's Sky became a place where a city is grown rather than built. It's a computer territory, faceted and, and abstracted, endlessly reprinting itself as the band requires. <coughs> where buildings tessellate down the landscape as an inhabited geology of crevice rooms and public valleys. And its material fabric has evolved as a complex endemic ecology where nature and technology intertwine and where biology becomes an economy. So the city developed um, 
in the near future heavily influenced by the imminent boom of the Indian subcontinent, uh, an emerging technology and economic super superpower. The idea that it's somewhere, it's a kind of a hybrid culture, somewhere between the Bollywood call centre and the European cultural capital. Um, and we're now developing this fictional city in its next phase, its next incarnation, as the major exhibition for the Lisbon Architecture Triennale in September. Titled Future Perfect, what we're going to do is zoom in to a fragment of this future city um, to develop it uh, and inhabit it as a one-to-one -one immersive theatrical experience. So we're commissioning five districts or environments of the city, um, collaboration between an artist or designer and a tech partner or research group. Um, projects like a bioengineered forest by um, the biotech artist Colin Van Balen, uh, an emphatic telepresence interface by Marshmallow Laser, Laser Feast, the rituals and body augmentations of the city and its subcultures by um, fashion designer Bart Hess, who um, you might know from Lady Gaga's slime dress, um, and a real scale 3D printing building site, growing a piece of the city across the course of the exhibition by Neri Oxman in the MIT Media Lab. And a sci-fi film, a short film um, developed with Factory 15, who are long-time collaborators with Unknown Fields. So what are we trying to do, and perhaps what, what Brave New Now is, is, as an imaginary city that I'm going to take you on a journey through, is explore this idea that fictionary is an extraordinary shared language. Um, and while we spend all our Friday evenings eating popcorn, watching some trashy movie, or we go to bed reading a novel, these these fictions are a way that we can start to connect an audience to, in really meaningful ways, I suppose, to the science and technology that is changing their world. And as part of that, uh, we also create a um, uh, future storytelling series um, with, with Jeff Mano, who runs the amazing blog Building Blog. Um, it's really wonder stories. It's a, it's a sci-fi storytelling jam with musical interludes, live demonstrations, and an ensemble of researchers that we put in direct dialogue with visualizers and image makers to tell a story of the future. Um, we ask each of them to, to tell a little short story. Um, and in the evenings, of, you know, it's, it's an evening of wondrous possibilities and dark cautionary tales. Uh, this is us um, with uh, the taxidermy artist Charlie Tuesday Gates um, doing a uh, rabbit live DIY taxidermy workshop um, and animatronics um, <laughs> experiment with Gustav Hogan who did all the animatronics for um, Ridley Scott's films. Um, and as Hannah mentioned, the teaching arm then of, of TTT is uh, the Unknown Fields Division. This is us on a rooftop in Chernobyl. I run it with Kate Davies, who um, is an architect, runs Liquid Factory. And really it's, it's the idea of a nomadic design studio um, that sets out across these unknown territories to explore our changing relationships with technology in the city. So far from the metropolis lie the dislocated hinterlands that support the modern city. A city like London is thoroughly embedded in a global network of landscapes and infrastructures that are too often forgotten, unseen, or ignored. So we go on two expeditions a year that takes us to these landscapes, exploring and following supply chains to visit these forgotten territories, alien terrains, and obsolete ecologies. Um, so across the last few years, we've um, based the studio on road trips through places like um, the irradiated wilderness of Chernobyl, um, the Arctic ice shelf um, and the climate change landscapes of far north Alaska, um, where, we, where we kind of, what we do, I guess, is we map the complex and contradictory realities of the present as a site of strange and extraordinary futures. To the fields of the Ecuador, oil fields of the Ecuadorian Amazon, uh, our most recent studio in the summer actually took us, um, we bought an old school bus off eBay uh, and went on a road trip through the UFO conspiracy spaceports and the freaks of Burning Man collecting fictions of militarized landscapes. Um, we've also traveled um, to the um, Dissonines of Galapagos, and in December we, we did a trip um, through Central America uh, on the occasion of the end of the world for the Mayan apocalypse, and spent, um, spent it with the linen pants and floral headbands of um, half of America uh, <laughs> and in uh, Chichen Itza and, and Guatemala. But really what, what, what we're trying to do is this idea that in Tomorrow's Thoughts of Day, in Thrilling Wonder Stories, in Unknown Fields Division, we explore alternative worlds as a means to understand our own world in new ways. So either through the design of the speculative and science fictional projects of TTT, or the real travel to strange and alien landscapes with the division. Just like this place. So this is a pop-up city from zero in China. And this is the same city, actually. This is its shadow. So there, 
well, we talk about them. We talk about them as twin cities, parallel cities. This is the Mount Newman iron ore mine on, on, on the right. Um, the hole, uh, which was mined, transported in trains that stretch kilometres, loaded onto a freighter and sent to China to be smelted into steel to make the city on the left. So what we're trying to do, I guess, and what I want to do tonight is, is the idea of remapping or reimagining the city and the, technique, the technologies it contains, not as discrete independent collections of buildings, but as a relational object that conditions and is conditioned by a wider range of local and global landscapes. The city casts shadows that stretch far and wide. It is a city that is atomized, uh, a distributed ground stretched across the planet. So we're interested in both the relationships between the city and its dislocated hinterlands, both in terms of systems, infrastructures, and supply chains that link urban environments materially to distant places, as well as the contemporary narratives, the fictions and stories that reveal cultural and social relationships between these landscapes. So our, our interest and our hope is that by narrating these systems, by telling stories about them, creating new fictions within them, and treating them as a form of, I, I guess, as a new kind of site, um, a new idea of place starts to help us begin to imagine this complexity and how we might operate within it in alternative ways. So, as I said, what I want to do is narrate this new city, the brave new now, a city stretched across the earth in holes in the ground, in fiber optic cables, on circuit boards, in objects. The shadow cities that we all unwittingly inhabit every day of our lives. It will be a whistle-stop walking tour through the wonders of nature, some real landscapes that we visited with the division across the last couple of years and some imagined as projects by TTT or with the studio. The irony being that we may not be able to tell which one is which. And like avid twitchers or bird watchers, we will note the strange creatures of technology and the menagerie of infrastructures that we encounter along the way. We begin our wander through the city. Looking around, I see a place I know, but at the same time find utterly unfamiliar. She asked me where we are. We walk on and come to the edge of a new territory. We look out across an evolving fragment in endless construction. There, the traditional infrastructures of roads, buildings, and public squares are giving way to ephemeral global supply chains, logistics infrastructure, digital networks, biotechnology, and cloud computing connections. The physical city as we know it is dissolving. She asks, is our city still a city anymore? At the very least, the design of this city is being redefined. Architects and designers once speculated on the impacts of industrialization and mass production. Thinking about this new city, we start to suggest alternative forms of super-scale design practice, whereby we can again play a critical role in speculating on the implications and consequences of emerging technologies. We have come to the city at the beginning of its life. It is a brave new now. She whispers while we listen to the whistle of computer cooling and the bleeps of mirrored beasts living their luminous lives. We started it at its edges, the mysterious interior of desert plains and mining landscapes. In the distance, we see the light of the city that these landscapes have created. <laughs> the history of these remote technologies, these remote landscapes, sorry, is one of nuclear testing, rocket launches, and black military technologies. The skies over this red earth are scarred with the contrails of experimental weapons flights and charged with militarized waves that reach out to US troops in Afghanistan and Iraq. Forgotten somewhere in this landscape, we crumble, stumble across an abandoned missile tracking station. From here, a choreographed flock of autonomous gliders drift through the air in silent protest. Floating on engineered <laughs> thermal currents, their wingspan antennas broadcast white noise through the electromagnetic landscapes over the nearby military base which coordinates drone strikes half a world away. They momentarily jam the telecommunications systems, an infrastructure of static and disturbance.
tread an equally contested ground. These are the dislocated resource sites that support the Brave New Now. They are new landscapes existing in the periphery, but strangely dependent on the technology of our more familiar metropolises. We stare out across the gold mine, a site whose gold is embedded in all the pieces of technology we are carrying around with us now. We each have a little piece of this ground on us. It is a landscape that has been exploded into an endless constellation of artifacts. Like this familiar specimen, a cute but strangely annoying creature that lives in all our pockets. This is how we typically understand this little guy, 16 gigabytes of memory. Or this, 4,000 songs. But its real effects are this, 0.034 grams of gold, and in turn this. These holes are cut out of this landscape, in actuality. The paintings of the Aboriginal Australian Dreamtime that catalog the creation stories of their mythology. Aboriginal Dreamtime narratives speak of a time when the ground was soft and creation beings shaped mountains and rivers, the rainbow serpent slinking to create a river, a wild dog coming to rest and forming a mountain. These stories are sung of the creatures as paths of walk through the landscape. These song lines and mythic fictions are cut with the white scars of modern mining now. This is a painting from Lorraine Sampson, who sits on a porch doing these paintings, watching the iron ore trains go by. She says the line, uh, she sits and watches the trains take her country away. They're the scars that are themselves shaped by modern fictions, that are the virtual values of fluctuating gold prices. These are real-time models of the gold mine. They connected live to the gold price index on the stock market. So here we see in green the gold, the iron ore, uh, the gold ore, sorry, and around it, the continually changing shape of the mine, soon to be carved out of the earth. It's a data geology. What happens is, as the, the mine model, the white, is linked to the, to the stock price, when this gold price is high, it becomes cost-effective to mine areas of lower concentrations of gold. When the gold price is high, you, you mine um, an area closer to the green. So what's happening is, at the scale of the Grand Canyon, we're etching the fluctuations of the virtual gold price into the ground. It's an icon of the Anthropocenic period, a period where the dominant processes that shape our planet are mechanical rather than geological. Explosive diggers and drills have replaced the slow erosion of rivers and earthquakes. And here is the mythical beast of the Anthropocene. And here it is in its home, one mile below ground. It crushes and explodes the gold ore Manipulated by remote control operators, dumped into a truck the size of a city, ground up, processed in tanks of cyanide, rinsed and settled, processed through bioengineered gold-eating bacteria in an industrial organic soup before being filtered off and piped to the gold room. A high security room that one man in the mine has access to. We encounter a modern alchemist in the brave new now. We shake his hand, a hero amongst the gold, the, the gold miners, Pete the gold pourer. And this is Pete. And here Pete pours the gold and weighs it 19.8 kilograms, 250,000 US dollars that we hold in our hands. The result of 200 trucks the size of buildings, dug out of the ground, quantified and then scattered around the world and put back into the ground in a handful of vaults where it stays to be traded virtually. All the gold dots are the mines around the world, the white dots are the vaults in which that's stored underground. The fictions of commodity prices, the infrastructures of the digital and algorithmic world have extraordinary physical implications at the scale of the planet. One can imagine a new infrastructure of gold objects, a glittering architecture exploded across the globe as a network of artifacts. We reimagine the infrastructures of gold solely virtual value through a dispersed geology of artifacts inscribed with oral histories, personal stories, and things of some kind of sentimental value. Like the Voyager Gold Record, the gold bar is redesigned as schools of lost and endangered languages from the indigenous sites where the resource was originally extracted. The gold vault becomes an archive of cultural information. This is the gold-plated headphone jack. Um, it's embodied within it the indigenous song lines from the place where the gold was abstracted. And just like the secret tracks of a Beatles record, hidden within the tunes of the latest pop song are the endangered oral histories from the mine site. The sound of a grandmother's laughter is encoded into an heirloom necklace. Mary Anderson, who works at a diner in Rhode Island, she likes to read Hello and Vogue magazine and dreams of having a better life. If I am beautiful, she thinks to herself, I can get out of here. So night by night, she sweeps the floors and cleans the grime from the ovens, collecting pennies that she is saving to make herself beautiful. 
As her hands become rough, she works towards implants that will remove the tired lines from her eyes, onto which her ideal DNA is recorded. When I'm gone, she thinks, they'll read who I really am inside. And the suicide bullet used by Hunter S. Thompson in 2005, inscribed along its contours is a note to his wife Anita, which he entitled, Football Season is Over. No more games, no more bombs, no more walking, no more fun. No more swimming, 67, that's 17 years past 50. 17 more than I needed or wanted. Boring, I'm always bitchy, no fun for anybody. 67, you are getting greedy. Act your age, relax, this won't hurt. So from the deserts we head to the coast and navigate an offshore archipelago, an iconic wilderness like the Galapagos Islands, like Darwin's living wonder camera, the birthplace of the theory of the origin of the species. We are guided ashore by the US Navy. A, a team of strobe like women, <coughs> dolphins and sea lions protect the coastline against enemy swimmers. When they find an intruder, they drop a strobe light nearby. It illuminates the surface, marking the spot, drawing hearing security guards nearby to handle the rest. We pass the island of Levi's. We are not in Texas anymore. It's a new city composed of all the places across the planet that are touched by the Levi's 501 supply chain. It's a city the size of the planet that we find in our pants. <laughs> a pair of jeans travels 18,744 kilometers across the planet in its process of manufacture. If we were to collapse all of these processes and factories down into a single city, however, it would just be two kilometers long. We passed the island of BMW. Fourteen nations collapsed into a car. We passed the island of Boeing 787. On this island is the biggest building on the planet, the Boeing Everett Assembly Plant. We have conceived of an object so complex, so intricate, that it requires the collective effort of the planet to build, a world project stitching together landscapes, people, and artifacts from across the globe. We passed Nike Town. A population of 1.26 million workers, a little smaller than the size of Manhattan, a little bigger than Madrid. In our city, we once dreamed of an atomic utopia, an energy city. Under the shadows of nuclear disaster, as we move from Nike Town, we find from a rooftop an overgrown apartment block in Pripyat, Ukraine, where the division surveys the irradiated wilderness of the Chernobyl exclusion zone and bear witness to a sobering post apocalyptic vision. This is a landscape of failed dreams of technological dominance over nature, a site where we once to explore the edges and fundamental forces of physics. It itself was actually once called the city of tomorrow. It is now a post-industrial landscape, a new wilderness somewhere between promise and despair, a city gone feral. We meet the free settlers that have illegally moved back in. Against the Ukrainian government, warnings they have moved back home, living off the land, raising chickens and picking blueberries. He holds up a postcard we gave him. It reads, I'll be home soon. Here we encounter in this landscape the new infrastructures of remote surveillance. We built these creatures to venture into areas of post-human landscapes too hazardous for us to explore. Fashioned after the early robots used to clean up after the disaster, which are actually repurposed experimental Louvre rovers, uh, lunar rovers, sorry, their circuit boards elicit strange and unexpected behavior when they encounter high levels of radiation. We see these landscapes remotely through the eyes of these nervous machines. They create a new landscape of their own. At the 30 kilometer security check, the division's guide, a security guard here, tells us stories of his nights with his colleagues in the zone. Some years previously, a research team from GSC Game World, the Ukrainian gaming company, surveyed this landscape. They produced the game Stalker, based on the meticulous photorealistic renderings of this very context. Local children from the surrounding towns, avid fanboys of the game, now break into the zone at night to reenact their characters and favorite scenes from the game. Playing out their own virtual roles, the real guards enjoy chasing them through the crumble of the buildings. A simulated city layered over a physical one, a parallel city, a deep city, that exists simultaneously in the real and in the digital. The city is here and here, distributed across the planet into flickering constellations of luminous rectangles. I tell her about what's above. Drifting at 6,711 miles an hour is an intricate and improbable creation, delicately dancing with gravity as a system of satellites. 
They are another city, a GPS city, existing simultaneously overlaid across our own. GPS is fundamentally changing the way that local Inipiet uh, in far north Alaska navigate the landscape. It is creating a young generation of, of landscape illiterate. It is a dangerous place to become dependent on technology. So what are the implications of a navigational system based solely on the virtual coordinates of GPS markers? We jam the GPS networks and reveal an alternative virtual topography, a territorial architecture of spoof cartography. As traditional wayfinding practices give way to GPS instrumentation, this live visualization developed in Unknown Field Studio by Will Gallen translates the distortions and disturbances of Alaska's GPS navigational network into a new landscape, ever-shifting, a digital territory. Would you like to check in at your current location? Sharing location on Facebook, Twitter, Foursquare, Google Plus, and MySpace. Digital cartographic landmark detected. These digital icebergs were launched yesterday, Wednesday, January 4th, and will reach the Chukchisi oil fields in 3 days, 14 hours and 27 minutes. Navigational disruption expected with 11 of 17 oil tankers in the autonomously navigated shipping lanes. icebergs drift through the autonomously navigated oil shipping lanes. An oil company hides its activity behind the clouds of spoof GPS mountains. It is a strange artifice earth, a new surface constructed of waypoints and satellite sight lines. We glance up from our screens, we walk on. I take it to another city, another earth. This is the earth simulator built by NEC for the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency. It was the world's fastest supercomputer between 2002 and 2004. The Earth simulator is used to run global climate simulations for both the atmosphere and the oceans. And this is the Kraken. The IBM Blue Gene developed to simulate biochemical processes. The IBM Roadrunner. And this is the Jaguar. With a peak speed of 2.33 petaflops, over 2,000 trillion calculations per second, the Jaguar is the world's fastest supercomputer for unclassified research. Capable of simulating climate models of unprecedented resolution, this global menagerie of supercomputers, calculating natures, named after natures, informing policy and ecological strategy, designed to compute the complexities and interconnected natures of our world. And this is the UK Met Office supercomputer, a data infrastructure the size of two football pitches calculating weather models and predicting the implications and consequences of climate change. The climate models of the Met Office consume the same energy as a small town, making the Met Office the most polluting building in the whole of Europe. The virtual climate simulation models become an input in their own calculations. The infrastructures of prediction, modeling, mapping and simulation slowly become the landscapes themselves their own microclimates and air cycles, their own reflexive energy systems. This is a supercomputer we meet in the brave new now called Pac-Man, with its banks of parallel processes, performing trillions of operations per second, calculating the future of our planet. Embedded within its circuits is a city of far north Alaska, programmed with data collected by Arctic scientists and local whale hunting captains. We visit the Arctic refuge landscape, reimagined as the world's fastest supercomputer. A hypertext landscape is a probability machine where calculated predictions coexist with the unpredictable. How much is a caribou worth? And is that worth more than the unknown cost of quantity of oil in the Arctic refuge? Is the cost of extracting that unknown quantity of oil lower than the cost of cleaning up the possibility of an oil spill? Supercomputers become the new oracles as they attempt to calculate these variables to inform policy and long-term strategy. 
As these supercomputers model the complexity of nature, they become increasingly indistinguishable from the landscapes they are modeling. Good morning, and as you join us, the Frontier Survey Company, Avid Computational Algorithms, puts Amor reserves between 5 to 16 billion barrels. 10 mega election polls in bloom as political parties run future policies, generating speculative land values in Region 8. Land futures fluctuate as we see models follow predictive outcomes. As OPEC projects $100 a barrel, geographically dispersed pools of risk computation form for all major energy companies. 90 gig pool mining ExxonMobil credit risk information, acceptable risk for ExxonMobil at 7 billion barrels. Exxon, BP, and TransCanada run complex risk algorithms where flows of high to low level threats to profit margins are introduced. Following TransCanada risk margin model, high-level threshold at logic gate 25B as unforeseen holdups are embedded into the algorithm. One terabyte runs infrastructural issues due to unfavorable climate for drilling. Models run for drill bit supply issues from the Far East. One petabyte computational risk projections for TransCanada puts their accepted risk margins of AMR reserve at 12 billion barrels. A speculated model of 40% drop in fertilizer production in Texas, Home Energy Corporation model of prolonged winter, 8% rise in home oil prices, from solvent deodorant decline to governmentally imposed carbon tax, nine petabytes of data steadily predicts the trajectory of land values of the animal. A late ripple in the market as it reacts to scenarios of unrest in the Middle East. Land and oil valuations dance in opposition as crude closes out a seasonal record of 200 a barrel. Cities and landscape are the scale of the planet to compress to the scale of control rooms. This is the SCADA city, which stands for Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition, a city brain, regulating our energy, our water, managing our traffic. The complexities of urban culture, life and wonder reduced to management protocols and low-res systems diagrams. I tell her we must understand these machines as cities and landscapes as well. Landscapes of the technology and technologies of landscape. We begin to understand the complex connections that exist between our everyday lives and our wider global context. Our contemporary metropolis is dependent on these landscapes, these remote wildernesses that lie behind the scenes of modern living. It shapes them and is supported by them. We are getting closer to the center now. She sums across the uneven ground. It is faceted and abstracted. A computer geology, part rock pool, part sedimentary construction site, glistening with moisture, bathed in the light from street lamp stars. A space where shopping trolleys scurry about in search of a home, where nature hums and crackles with the sound of flickering fluorescence. And behind the scene, the Skyder City watches and the traffic lights flash red. Some birds have refined their technique. They station themselves beside pedestrian crossings. Wait for the lights to stop the traffic. The massive elephant seal brings traffic to a halt in Brazil. The animal, which was estimated to weigh more than half a ton, took a leisurely stroll through the streets of Balneario Camaro, a 10 foot sea creature waddled out of the Atlantic and headed up the beach before blocking traffic on the main street for more than an hour. Police officers and firefighters splashed water on the elephant seal, which politely used the crossing to keep it wet during its unexpected adventure as shoppers and tourists snapped pictures and videos. And it simply popped back into the water. 
the systems and mechanisms of the city now regulate wildlife. Cities are becoming contemporary jungles, new geologies. These modern landscapes are now watched by scientists as hotbeds of evolutionary change. Animals have found their way back into the city. A number of them have grown dependent on the artificial technologically, technologically mediated landscapes that we have provided for them. And technology is now a key driver in evolutionary change. Here we watch as the raccoons in San Francisco have learned the number 18 bus timetable. A driver every night brings tins of dog food for them to feed on. Raccoons become dependent on the city. If we were to take our world away, they would no longer be able to survive. But far from being city pests, they are actually new city recyclers, turning our trash to compost and perhaps should be encouraged further into our cities. We begin to see new creatures, perhaps the result of a parasitic tet infection, or the mutant offspring of engineered specimen interbreeding, this lame creature darts to the safety of the shadows to munch on its prey. She had a binoculars slung around her neck, the first lab bullet birds we see as we step upon the rugged shores of the brain of now city is a flock of gaseous canaries, and their joyful notes are the first to salute our ear. High above the rooftop vents drift the green-throated sentinel canaries, bioengineered to be sensitive to increased levels of CO2, just like their historic counterparts down the mines. I read from the birdwatcher's guide we were given for our walk. This is the note for the green-throated coal gun. When in the presence of high levels of carbon dioxide, their plumage phase shifts to an extraordinary emerald colour. They can be found in gatherings around remaining coal-burning power stations and carbon sequestration centres. Take a fire extinguisher with you to draw them out of the trees. A note of caution is necessary when calling and tracking these birds, as evidenced by the ongoing litigation against the BBC documentary team for frivolous chemical spraying. <laughs> The plumage, of the, the plumage of the rose shift canaries catch the sun as their fantails shift and spring into life in the clouds of nutrients. Coal miners once hammered rock to the twitter of canaries that lived beside them, their changing birds on a warning alarm to a dangerous gas leak. Echoing across the brave new now is a design infrastructure of singing sentinels as bioengineered birds once again manage, manages the air for us. Alternative bird birdsong ring out and as a soundtrack to the anthropocenic spaces of tomorrow, an elegy for a changing planet. The reading for the rose shift starling. Typically brown and forgettable at ground level, in the presence of the greenhouse gas nitrous oxide, the rose shift starling displays a fan tail of extraordinary incandescent plumage that reflects in the sunlight. These rare species are best spotted in gas clouds at high altitudes over recently fertilized farmland. If you do encounter one at ground, however, Emptying a nitrous canister nearby will initiate its vivid display. These can be acquired from custom car garages or contact us for our private list of birding dentists. <laughs> Note of caution, however, the guide does not in encourage nitrous use for anything other than bird watching. We do not support the Laughing Birders Association. <laughs> <laughs> Through it, we glimpse the clouds beyond, thick with seeds of bacteria. There is a materiality to the weather here. She brushes the spores from her hair. Sharing these skies are drifting flocks of artificial clouds, sensitive to high frequency signals. We dial up a few on our tweak decks. They rain in our neighbor's barbecue and mud up the soil for a music festival slip and slide. A natural gardener's protest movement cuts them down and sets the hydrogen filled bodies alight. They are powered by a hydrogen fuel cell generating lift through a trolysis of water. We can interface with this new nature on our phones emitting different tones of sound, calling them near or pushing them away in an acoustic form of weather control. And then above us, the night air rumbles with a low hum. A flickering form of cybernetic fireflies plays above the rooftops. As a mobile network infrastructure, the flock broadcasts its signal in a luminous cloud, fading in and out over the city. Following the intensity of the electromagnetic spectrum, they map network strength across the sky. As we look up in wonder, our faces bright in the rolling glow of a Wi-Fi aurora. What it suggests is that certain infrastructures are becoming mobile. We think of these robotic works as new forms of infrastructure, where the mechanic mechanisms of the city are exploded into dynamic systems, swarms, and flocks capable of embedding themselves within the cycles of the landscape. 
we start to relate in a more intimate way to industry and infrastructure rather than, than it just existing out on the periphery. We also start to think about the internet as another city, not a cloud city of ephemeral webs and connections as we think about it here, but the internet is a physical city distributed across the planet, where a 75-year-old woman scavenging for copper cuts off the internet to the whole of Armenia. <laughs> it's a new wilderness, a new city, with a very real physicality. This is the weight of the internet measured in electrons, 60 grams or measured by the weight of servers that powers at 182,500 tons. The web is a machine consuming 5% of all the world's power. The internet is responsible for 2% of global carbon emissions, same as Argentina. A web with shadows and blackouts, managed by companies and nation states, where three men are arrested off Alexandria, accused of trying to cut the internet to Egypt by sabotaging an undersea cable called CWEME4. The US military have developed aerial systems to force the internet on dictators who have closed down or censored their own network. An instant internet city is a form of weaponized connectivity. The same tech is not just in the hands of the military. In the skies we see flocks of birds dancing, but with them we see drifting on the thermals, a new system of internet creatures. Infrastructure has exploded into bits to roam the earth in an architecture of everywhere, an open source sky. It is a walled city of invisible barriers patrolled by drone networks mapped by satellites. A flickering flock of pirate internet drones scans across the skyline. in the bravery now suggests new forms of community. It is a time when the virtual city, when the city is itself in question. We are much closer to our virtual community than we are to our neighbours. The Egyptian revolution was a community formed through a network. This death of physical place has created new forms of city based around what we are interested in. Our culture, the push for revolution in the Middle East, 
or a love of 90s boy bands. We tickle our iPads and iPhones. We block out the world with our iTunes and our iPods. These are all our I needs and our I wants, and we stare on in wonder watching iPlayer as we locate ourselves in cities, not through sight lines and orientation points, but glowing rectangles and dancing fingers. We no longer define ourselves by a physical location in space. We are brave new now nodes. We are both our digital selves and our physical selves. At the resolution of Google Earth, a pixel is just a bit bigger than the width of my body. At this public resolution, we don't see us. We are a discoloration, a smudge, thoroughly embedded in the grain of the technology, indistinguishable from the city and the technology that surrounds us. Just like this little bastard, Justin Bieber. <laughs> You can't think of him as just an ordinary 16-year-old kid. To understand people like him and increasingly people like us, you've got to look not just at him, but all the media created around him and by him. And Kevin Warwick, another friend we meet in the Brave New Now. He implants a chip into his arm and a transmitter into the LED jewelry of his poor wife down here on the left. <laughs> now her necklace glows red every time her husband gets an erection. <laughs> <laughs> and Victoria Beckham. Another augmented being, creamed and plucked, plucked and liposucked into a new nature version of a mother of three. And me, with a plate that holds my head together for an operation when I was born. For in this world, the physicality and biology of the body is in question, and, there, and the MRI scan becomes a new form of portraiture, and the new sights in the body become a, a site for prosperic infrastructure at the scale of the void spaces of the body. In between my intestinal tract and my spine, we see, we see an internal biocomputing prosthetic that we developed for the cloud computing world. We augment ourselves for the new senses of this digital landscape. We tattoo ourselves with conductive ink that animates the skin with a new tribal ornamentation generated from the magnetic field of our internal Wi-Fi antennas. Digital connectivity becomes a part of the natural mineralization processes of the body as our unique IP addresses fossilize like the bones within us. Virtual interactions become a part of our physical selves and crowdsourced computation becomes a new kind of magic. He showed me his photo from the instant, instant portrait endoscopy group. His picture was going straight on the wall. He looked down at the flickering ornamentation on his chest as his conductive ink tattoo took on the form of a wireless field of a digital broadcast. Through electrical impulses, we can sense the virtual interactions of the crowd in a new infrastructure of collective computation. He held in his hand the unique mineralized implant of a lost loved one. He would never forget her broadcasts. His star sign said his favorite satellite was below the horizon this time. He hated this time of year. He had always loved his IP address. He just had to touch it. He cut it out and held it in his hand and marveled at its intricacy. And as we finish our tour, we have come from the wilds of the jungle, the landscapes of Australia, to the intimacy of our own bodies and we take a rest on the couch in the ordinary spaces of the living room. So the sun sets on the brave new now, the suburban aurora begins to glow and flickering screens illuminate the faces of Twitterers, Facebookers and Google explorers. Our homes are now the front line for new technological innovation. Just like every cliche tech talk, you see a strange creature living in the home Whirring and sucking, consuming dust, an endless appetite, a dust bag stomach that must be cleaned and emptied every three weeks, and the cat rides the robot vacuum cleaner, and we're not really sure which one is our pet anymore. <laughs> a robot toilet that cleans us as we sit, warms our ass, it tells us the time, it diagnoses our health and connects us to the web. It is comforting to know that these intriguing unnatural specimens have made it here with us. After nature, their songs still sound, the LEDs flash and their cooling fans still spin. So our journey through the Brave New Now has taken us across the earth, from the hole in the ground to the point of consumption through landscapes at the scale of the electron affecting landscape at the scale of mountains and canyons. But we realize that there is no nature anymore, there is no city, or perhaps there is city everywhere. What we see is technology, engineered systems, augmented environments, and invisible fields. 
It is important to travel to these places in fiction and, and physically. In this project, I released 80 canaries into a sealed gallery space. Slowly, I increased the levels of CO2 in the gallery, in line with predicted increases if our culture continues without change. It is an accelerated form of climate change. The gas mask is for a dramatic effect. No <laughs> birds were harmed uh, during the course of the project. Against the rise in CO2, I narrate the predicted developments of technology. The wonders of possible progress. In 50 years, the birds are no longer singing. If we listen, we are strolling towards a silent spring. When I work through the brave view now, perhaps we see how as designers we can imagine instigating new cultural relationships with the inevitable byproducts of industry, a changing climate, and the Anthropocenic world. <coughs> we can imagine objects with design shadows that stretch across the planet, resonant objects, deep objects, objects that can change and redirect flows, an object that exists here and here, an object that has presence across all of these landscapes that we describe in the brave view now. Choreographic objects, relational objects, as a distributed architecture, reprogramming the world, generating new encounters and relationships with the complexities of a global context rather than an individual site or product. Some of the people we walk and our meet on our some of the people we meet on our walk through the Brave New Now are swept up in what the city could be. Others are reserved and look on with caution. It's a place of wonder and of fear. We make friends, we hear their stories and we share their lives. We are a generation privileged enough to bear witness to this emerging world and that is an extraordinary place to be on the cutting edge of the potential for change. A powerful place to become aware and deepen our understanding of what it means to design for this world. The city is vast and wondrous and strange. In the brave new now we look out across the gold price, etched into an artificial Grand Canyon. While a cat rides a robot vacuum cleaner and we take a shit on a toilet that asks us how our day is. The city is vast and wondrous and strange. Thanks. Thank you very much for that amazing presentation. Um, feeling lots of people are going to have some questions and. Observations on our kind of whistle top tour through our near future city. Um, but future before, that's already here. Perhaps. But exactly, I can't be a, a sort of a permanent now. Mm -hmm. um, but before throwing it open, I wanted to um, actually, you know, kind of ask you where do you situate this this kind of thinking. So, how do you describe yourself? What is this, you know, kind of field of practice for you? Um, I mean, I, on my customs form, whenever I come in and out of the country, I write architect. Like, I still think I'm an architect, and I, I don't design buildings or make buildings. I have no desire to, but, but I think what I presented is some form of architecture. It's certainly design. Um, I guess my interest in, in, in some, some of our roles of practitioners is based on this idea that, that architects, designers, urbanists, um, 
somehow sit in this unique space between the cultural and the technological. Um, and I think that's really an extraordinary point where you can sit in a bar, and like we were saying earlier on, and have a conversation with an engineer or a filmmaker um, that we're able to synthesize complex factors, environmental, social, cultural, ecological. Um, and I think that, in a way, the role of the architect is kind of wasted on making buildings. And certainly, the, the, you know, the, the buildings used to play really critical more than what cities were. Certainly, the traditional infrastructure of cities that are permanent, fixed, of the physical spectrum. Um, we used to be able to engage with that world and hence start, start to engage with what the city is. And as the city starts to move and we find these new forms of city, like I described in the Brave View Now, um, outside of the physical spectrum, then it seems that to cite traditional form of practice within that physical spectrum solely um, denies the possibility for us to act effectively within the contemporary city. So we kind of argue with this sort of work um, for an expanded role of of the architect or the urbanist mm -hmm. to start to include an acknowledgement and an engagement with the broader notions of what place is, mm -hmm. um, broader notions of what city is that extend beyond just physical site, mm -hmm. but actually include software, infrastructures, mediated technologies, supply chains, um, satellite networks, these things that are fundamental in making and shaping what a city was. And, 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 I mean, th this notion of how we reveal and critique and situate infrastructures which are fundamental to our experience mm. of, you know, kind of living in contemporary life mm. um, is something that's a key concern for us here at Lighthouse. We've done several um, series of projects in that domain. But I think there's also some interesting observations to make about how we do that and, and where our role is if you want kind of flaneur or observer of mm. these, you know, kind of, uh, if you want kind of changing environments, starts and ends, and where our role is, if you want kind of critical agent, um, change maker, tactical, you know, kind of uh, maneuverer is. Mm. And, you know, I wonder, you know, kind of where you situate yourself within that spectrum, because there's clearly a quite sort of deliberate, you know, kind of, poetic, you know, kind of romanticism or an evocation of, you know, kind of the sublime of the flaneur, which you are, you know, kind of um, pointing to heavily within the discourse. <coughs> but at the same time, with something like electronic um, countermeasures, whilst you emphasised its, uh, you know, kind of, if you want, its, its role as an emergent creature, it's also a tactical media project, you know, it's a deployment of a... Mm you know, a functional kind of community Wi-Fi network. So where do you, like, do, do you feel a need to situate yourself somewhere on that spectrum, or do you feel you can kind of do both a sort of romantic observer mm. and, you know, kind of tactical agent jobs yeah, yeah. at the same time? Yeah. I mean, I think we have to, we have to do both in a way. Like, we, we love this phrase, um, Alex Stefan um, writes about, which is uh, system storytelling, mm -hmm. but somehow that, you know, these networks that we're trying to describe here are so, so vast and complex that they're so difficult to comprehend and start to understand. But like I said, fiction is this extraordinary shared medium. But through story, telling stories about these things, or at least engaging with the media narratives and stories that we already discuss about these things, we can we can actually connect with them in new ways. It relates to again what I was talking about earlier, where we were on a, a panel with um, some guys from Greenpeace um, a couple of months ago talking about. Um, the work of unknown fields, and, and they were talking about their work, and it was really interesting the way that they described the traditions and history of the conservation movement, and were moving out of the dominant model, which was about bearing witness. It was telling these stories about these landscapes, so they would show us the, the duck covered in oil, um, the polar bear drifting across the ice flow as the ice melts around it prematurely, and the assumption was that if, if we understood that these things existed out in the world, we would somehow change what it is that we would do. And obviously that's proven to be complete bullshit. And we know that shit's happening, but we don't do anything at all. Um, so the idea of just bearing witness, just you know, moving through these landscapes and, and describing them isn't enough. Yeah. But we need to present counter-narratives. And I think... Um, so that's what we try and do is both identify these conditions and narrate them in a way that reveals them, but then to engage with them yeah. and to to, cite, to use them as sites for new work. Mm -hmm. um, in this case, speculative fictions, 
um, or countermeasures, which is which is more, I guess, more in the media arts world. But it's certainly it's also in, potentially in the world of the startup um, and and product design um, and systems engineering. So I think that that idea of moving beyond just bearing witness to a condition, but actually re-narrating it and recontextualizing it and then engaging with it as, uh, as a site is, is really fundamental. Mm -hmm. And how, you know, the, there's almost a sort of parallel kind of track, I suppose, of, if you want, sort of infrastructure fiction, if we can say mm -hmm. such a thing exists, which might be best embodied by um, the kind of critical engineering movement, which is, mm -hmm. you know, where you go a wee bit beyond speculative fiction and you actually try and intervene within these infrastructures. And if you want, change the narrative through hacking the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So, would, you know, are there moments where you feel that your job is to kind of go that far? Um, you know, kind of, where do you start and stop? Yeah, I mean, I think there's, like, there's different ways of engaging in these contexts, right? Like, um, there's the speculative fiction, which is about trying to elaborate on and um, describe uh, an emerging culture, an emerging cultural condition, and it's about presenting um, somewhat abstract ideas or abstract ideas of emerging research, which is what Andrew Sky is about, is taking um, ideas out of the lab, uh, out of uh, research environments or from behind the walls of the institution and, and through a speculative fiction co-opt the techniques of film and present it to an audience in a way that they connect, can connect with it and develop emotional responses to it and start to develop more informed opinions about um, uh, how their world is changing. Uh, so I think a, there is a really interesting role for the, the non-applied um, speculation. Um, but equally, uh, you know the 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 project like electronic cannabis where we do go through a prototyping phase, we do launch it into the environment, we do these performances around the, around the place where we launch them out there, and people can upload files and share data, um, and they, these you know, they become strange cross sections through a different place depending on what people upload, and we start to imagine new you know uh, data is a new way to start to define the city. You know we go to a certain place in East London because that's where the best music is uploaded, not because that's mm. where the best live venues are. Or you, you hang around the suburbs to, to get the best porn or something, you know, like, <laughs> to remap the city through data ecologies. And I think that, that that's only revealed when you start to move beyond what we could have done in animation into prototyping, working with roboticists and actually um, and systems engineers, engineers building these things and then flying them around. Mm. So I think there's a, there's a space for both types yeah. of work, right? It depends on the nature of what one's engaging with. I'm sure we've got lots of comments and questions and observations from our uh, extremely smart audience. Um, I've got lots more that I can ask, but have we got any? Th yes? Um, you've partially answered what I was going to ask, um, but um, I, I, was think, I was thinking architecture is a very good way of um, thinking about people without. Um, an individual being involved in that thought because it's a sort of collective thing to look at. Mm. It's sort of the individual is absent from the architecture, but the sort of hopes and the failures are kind of embodied in it. And I was thinking about this at the beginning of your thing, and um, and then because it's a city, there's that sort of massive um, that kind of um, thought and information, and it, I started to attach it later to that kind of idea of a swarm or a, um, a flock, you know, they're either mm. a beautiful thing or a horrifying thing. Mm. And um, that, that sort of high mass of data has that kind of frightening or awesome um, quality that a flock or a swarm has. And it's sort of like as if the individual can't... Um, it's, it's almost like as if maybe what you're doing is building a bridge for the individual to sort of locate themselves within that kind of awesome quality, either negatively or positively awesome. And I wondered, um, you know, I noticed at the end that you did bring it back to an individual perspective. Mm. And I wondered if what your thoughts about that were, well, because I mean, it's, 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 it's a constant difficult thing to locate yourself within mm. such a massive world, you know. Yeah, I mean, I think the, what's interesting about this moment is that I mean, the, the issues that, that kind of outlined in, in the Brave Green Now 
tour is they're, they're at, at such an extraordinary scale, one, one wonders what the responsibilities or the agency of the individual is within that. And I think that what we're trying to suggest is that potentially some of these, these, these technologies mean that um, individuals can start to aggregate, you know, and we can start to operate at scales that, that has the potential to, to engage with these sort of territorial manipulations we're doing at the scale of the planet. You know? So I think it's interesting to, to, to look at and what, you know, my description of how communities are starting to form or the nature of what a place is starts to change, starts to suggest that. You know? like London used to be defined because I lived in London, my friends lived in London, we were Londoners together, and that's what London was. But what does that mean when I have no idea who lives above me? Um, but I sit on Twitter most of the day having conversations, very intimate conversations with people scattered across the world. They're much more familiar to me than the people who are directly opposite um, in my physical space. You know? So I think an awareness of, you know, and an architect used to deal with sight in those same ways. You know? We used to deal with context and, and, and a building was to engage with context in that way. But what happens when context isn't made from the aggregate of people collectively living together, but is made from an aggregate of technologies, where a city is dispersed across a constellation of screens, not across a series of, of houses on a street. Um, so I think to, to actually explore that condition and look at the opportunities it presents for the ways that um, network culture starts to generate um, new forms of engagement, I think is really interesting. You know, and we, like, like the Middle East example, we saw how um, no, it's like, like Ben Hammersley talked about it in, he, I think he did a Royal, Royal Institute talk, or Royal Academy talk, one of those, um, where he talked about the idea that, um, the, from the Middle East uh, protests, that you know, mob mentality used to be about place, you used to run around, knock on someone's door, say, hey man, let's come out, we're, we're carrying pitchforks or torches, we're going to do this thing. And it, would, it was able to operate at a certain scale. Um, started or instigated by a group or an individual and then dispersing across a particular um, locus in, in physical space. But through the network, through organization on Facebook or text message, all of a sudden you get the coalescence of, of individuals at, the, at a scale and a force to topple governments. You know? And I think that becomes really interesting to, to think about how they both emerge but how one can start to acknowledge it and then start to design in those conditions. So in a way, that's sort of like the, that's almost like that the individual is already placed in a variety of different networks, and they can already see themselves in relationship to those networks. But when you see yourself as the one and looking at the whole, it's it's horrifyingly smooth. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. We've got other other comments, questions. Yeah, Alex. Yeah, um, you said quite a lot about earlier on, especially about economy. You said about the iPhone and I on gold and. You know, other kind of, and most of those resources you talked about, they were kind of resources that are finite, natural resources. So it's kind of like a scarcity-based economy mm -hmm. is what the model was. So I was wondering, so further into the future, do you think we will enter into a post-scarcity economy where we're kind of less reliant on natural resources or not really reliant on them at all? And if so, how do you think it would look? How would it function? Yeah, I'm not... I'm or is that too far? Like, yeah, it's kind of, I don't know, I mean, it's, it's interesting to have conversations about when we're talking about future, just how near or far that future is, right? Like, the, 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 hopefully the work that we do, or the work that at least we're interested in, explores a near future that's, that's believable enough to be visceral and tangible. You know, like post-scarcity futures and, 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 I don't know, they're, they're, they're still in the realms of fantasy for me. You know what I mean? It's like the difference between watching Star Wars and starry spaceships, skies, laser beams, and lightsabers versus 1984, you know, which is really about 1948, obviously, is the, is the cliche. So the, the point at which it becomes fantasy and becomes too distant for us to connect with um, is a point where it ceases to become critical, I think. So um, I think we're, you know, it, it, it's not something we're explicitly been thinking about. But what we have thought about in relation to that, to that I suppose, is, is you're right, I mean, the ones I've presented are, are very resource-based. But um, some of the, the new work, which is coming out of the studio at the moment, which is some of the maps of BBC, um, BMWs and Boeing 787s, is looking at um, labor as a commodity. Um, this, you know, another kind of resource that isn't quite as finite as exhausting gold supplies. Um, uh, and 
you know, we're, I think that becomes super interesting as something to address. That we're kind of remapping the planet based on labour markets, and um, you know, it, you know, you were looking at conditions where you know it, it, the the, the body is repurposed as a machine because it's cheaper to get a line of production workers to do something than it is to build a machine to do it for them. You know, so I think acknowledging labour as a resource is is something that um, we have to start to do. One, one of our students um, uh, started that, that project. He, he developed those maps. Um, he started by looking, designing a series of objects that could only be made in one place. So we, were, we went to Guatemala, which is the world's <coughs> firework production capital. Um, child labor um, is deployed to make fireworks, so he would make um, a child labor object, an object that's so intricate and small that only a child's fingers could, could get into it. Um, and he would make these very site-specific objects that would relate particularly to the labor economies of, of dispersed places around the world. Okay, two questions. I think Andrew was marginally. <laughs> <laughs> um, we used to talk, I mean, I'm not sure about maybe before anyone in this room was born, we used to talk about uh, nature as a kind of all of its uh, the world that mankind hasn't touched and mm. that we've not uh, encroached on. And, and maybe that's never really been true, maybe agriculture or some agriculture, that's always been a bit of a fiction, but given the kind of extensive colonisation of the natural world that you've shown us here, mm. it, is there any way to talk meaningfully about nature or the countryside? Yeah, no, well, not, 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 not. <laughs> I'm going to do another, do another, do another one of these storytelling talks, which is called Landscapes of Unnatural History, which is trying to, um, I mean, if we talk about infrastructure, in this case, we, that, that talk is talking about um, the infrastructures that have produced our idea of nature. So part of what we did with the division was go to places like the Ecuadorian Amazon, who we talked with biologists out there who um, are mapping the, the biotype and their landscape and they're identifying certain plants that um, never naturally should exist next to one another. And what we realize is that the Amazon jungle, the icon of the conservation movement, is actually a large cultivated garden that's emerged through nomadic communities, growing, planting, cultivating, moving on. Um, we also went to the Galapagos Islands and you know this, this icon of, of um, the very idea that, that, that nature is this evolving uh, thing. And what we saw is an extraordinary fight to conserve the idea of pristine wilderness. You know, we see um, the Australian ladybug has actually been introduced into the, um, into the Galapagos Islands to eat and introduce little bugs that's, that's destroying the leaves. Um, ecologists fly around in, in helicopter gunships shooting goats. I think they've, they've shot 20,000 goats a year. Um, because the goats eat the low-level um, foliage, which the which the turtles, um, the tortoises, sorry, uh, um, uh, eat. Um, so you have this extraordinary fight to preserve and fix a particular idea of nature in the site where the idea that nature is a continual process of change originated. And what we talk about the Galapagos as a as a large zoo, you know, it's a large curated zoo. We're curating an idea of wilderness, an idea of nature. Um, it's not to, that's not to underwrite the great hard-fought battles that the conservation movement has won across the last 10 years, but it's just to suggest that we need to be, um, we need a kind of a paradigm shift. We need a new way of conceptualizing our relationship to the natural world that isn't predicated on nature as being distinct from and separate to everything that we do as a culture, right? Because technology has always been a driver of in, in evolutionary change. And the sooner we acknowledge that, the sooner we look for new kind of opportunities for the relationship between technology and the artificial to actually start to support um, the ecology in new ways. So, we've got questions. Sue, do you still have one? No? I was going to ask you something. Having just come back from Dubai, All right. and then having been in New Orleans, I'm just wondering whether there is a kind of historical things about new cities emerging out of economies, as we were talking about, mm. certainly not necessarily environmental, but, but maybe they are. Yeah, I mean, we, there's a couple of things there. I mean, we're interested in the history of futures as well, right? So there's, there's certainly a history of real cities that emerge, but there's also a history of speculative cities which emerge, which I think um, we're really excited by. 
because this is what we're, what, you know, this, this, this critical design world, speculative fiction, all this sort of stuff that we talk about now, it's a bit hip and cool, isn't anything new. It's certainly not in architecture. We've been thinking about speculative cities for, for a long, long time. It, it's just that I think at certain points in history it made more sense than others, mm -hmm. right? And I think we're at a point where um, the speculative city is, is, is really interesting again. The future is becoming a project again, right? Like there's this great um, uh, um, interview that, that Cory Doctorow did with William Gibson in London a while ago where uh, William Gibson, the author of Neuromancer, um, the, the, the novel where the cyberspace was first originated, and he's, his early novels were set um, in, let's say, a, a 30 or 40 year period uh, from, from the time in which they're written. And across the last couple of decades, the, the novels have become set in a shorter and shorter shorter space away from the present to the point where now they're, they're contemporaneous, they're, they're set in the now. And he talks about that progression as being about the idea that, you know, in the 80s, there was, science fiction authors had this relative period of stability, you know, 30 or 40 years, where you could kind of write and you wouldn't be, it wouldn't look ridiculous in a few years' time, you know. You had the length of the now, um, in the 80s was about 30 or 40 years, and that length of now is shorter and shorter and shorter, the point where now's now is instantaneous, because there are so many balls in play that we just don't know where they're going to fall. Economic collapse, climate change, synthetic biology, all these things, we just, we don't know where the hell they're going, you know? So, to, to predict any, anything 30 or 40 years ahead is, there's no kind of certainty, there's no scope to do that with any stability. So the novels are all about alternative presence, in a way. So I think um, that's why, in a way, the speculative city is, we're sort of revalidating that and are interested in that again, because we think that it's starting to make sense again, right? So that's the history of um, uh, cities that we're kind of engaged with, I suppose, yeah. I, yeah, I'm just thinking about the money they're putting into New Orleans, keeping it going. Maybe we just move out. I don't know. I don't live there. So. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's also, I mean, like, we're, we're at a point where, like, the cities from zero that I, that I mentioned at the very start, we're doing this all over the world. I mean, Dubai is a city from zero. It's a yeah. fucking desert. It's so ridiculously hot. <laughs> to build a city there is bizarre, but they're looking ahead for when they run out of oil which is supposed to be a date, they keep on moving the date. I had a friend that, that I studied with in Australia who went over to Dubai to make a bunch of money and then come back to retire in Australia young. And he set up his practice, um, it was called 2020, which was the date when oil was supposed to run out. So he was like quite visibly going, yeah, I'm going to get in there, cash up, and then run. <laughs> but that, that period is, has now extended further and further and further. So but what they're doing is sort of re-gearing their economy post oil based around tourism and stuff. So they're building these ridiculous cities. Um, and we're doing it all over the world. I mean, China, the birth of the specialized city, the city from zero, is about propping up their economy. So they're building these cities. No one's living in them, but they need to be producing and making and manufacturing. You know? So this, this idea of the pop-up city, which under Tomo Sky is engaging with, I think is a really interesting contemporary um, phenomena that does hark back to things like Brasilia or something, you know, these planned cities that emerged in Brazil just because they wanted a capital, you know, where, where the making of cities becomes the tool of propaganda in a way. So, um, yeah, I think for a whole lot of reasons, now's now is a pretty intriguing place to be. I think that's one of the oft, uh, you know, kind of cited reasons for the, you know, kind of permanent but at, at this particular moment pressing crisis in science fiction whereby you know kind of the, the theory goes that you know kind of a particular type of science fiction such as was written in the 1980s is impossible now um, because you know kind of the, the the sort of playing field of uncertainty is 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 just so you know kind of <laughs> tricky and difficult and therefore um, practices like speculative architecture and design fiction are better place to be able to tell the stories yeah, yeah, that yeah. novelists used to tell. Would, you know, do you agree, or mm -hmm. is it is it something that you? Yeah, I mean, I, we'd love like Warren Ellis, who's um, uh, writing a story for 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 Future Perfect. Mm -hmm. um, that, uh, he was also part of the think tank front of Morris Sky. Is this lovely line where he talks about the idea that prediction is science fiction's side effect. Right, yeah. it's never, it's never it's actually never intended, job, right? Yeah. And it was, but it's you know the, the job of the fiction, the the author is about exaggerating the present, mm -hmm. as it means to look back at it in new ways. And I guess I understand that as a as 
as a, as a role of the fiction um, as being slightly different to perhaps what it, what it had, but it also that's where it connects with design fiction and, and design and speculation, is that idea of being able to exaggerate contemporary phenomena and represent it back in ways that we can start to connect to it. And, and, and perhaps that's something that has something to do with attention as well. I mean, perhaps, you know, kind of the, the, the novel is no longer necessarily the right, you know, kind of, if you want, sort of um, attention span to be able to kind of locate, you know, kind of these ideas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, yeah, and yeah. The, the, the slide and the micro, you know, kind of fight. Yeah, yeah. Perhaps yeah. as a bit of, you know, kind of medium. Yeah, yeah, maybe. I mean, we, we like this this book of fictions we're doing for um, for the the future city that I started with is a collection of short little pieces, mm. um, and they're, they're they're written they're written by authors by science fiction mm. authors, but they're but they're design fiction, mm. you know, like they're they working within the context that in this, this strange public think tank forum thing that we did, um, we designed this landscape and we imagined this stage set. And I think there's a really critical role that, that these authors are now playing, which is fleshing out this city. You know, so many his, architectural speculations are all about the form of the city. Mm -hmm. um, but something that we don't do, I mean, I, I call myself a writer, I'm not a fucking writer, like I can't write at all. Like, when we start to, you know, when, when I sit down and try and write stories and, and I, I try and write dialogue, it just sounds so stupid. I'm, I'm really not trained for that. I'm trained to supposedly know how a building, how a building stands up. But, so what these authors can do, and the reason why they're amazing as collaborators, is because they can start to imagine the life of these cities. They can imagine the new cultures that emerge. They can imagine new relationships that form. You know, Bruce has written a story for Under Troy Sky, which is called um, My Pretty Alluvian Bride, which is this bizarre tale um, of an arranged marriage. You know. Um, pulling from the, the Indian um, reference, Indian city's reference. Um, and through this, this relationship of a, of, a, of, a, of a guy becoming indoctrinated into this new place um, uh, to, in order to get married, he, he takes a tour through the city and we start to understand something about what the city is and how we start to relate to it. And it's only through the relationships that they develop, the character narratives, that we start to understand it in a new way. And I think that's um, a really exciting way that the that these collaborations can start to work. You know? We've probably got time for one more question. If someone has something burning they need to ask. Yes? Okay, last question. Yeah, I just wanted to know a bit more about the plans you had uh, to develop the large speculative city project you've got going with performance angles. Or are you, Is there any plans to move it into something which does require engagement and participation from them? you know, the audiences, because that is one thing that we can do now with all this technology that we could do when writing sci-fi novels. Mm. And it does, it seems like, just thinking about Alex's question and what you said about fantasy, that one can hear these words and see images and it can wash off both of you. Mm. But with the tools of interactive engagement, you can require people to dwell inside these imagined mm -hmm. cities and make decisions in those imagined cities. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think like it's pretty, it's pretty fresh. So I don't really want to go too much into it at this stage. And the first time I've ever publicly put a slide up there about the Lisbon architecture tree in Ali. But um, the idea there is that, like, you know, if we've, we've spent you know some time looking at the larger panorama of the city, this large scale model, the idea is to zoom in to a moment and commission a whole series of projects that are exploring this idea of the future and the future city and to present them at a scale that people can inhabit. So I talk about them as districts or ecologies or atmospheres where they're all kind of gathered together in a space. It's not an exhibition as in white walls and plinths with little labels, but it's an environment. And the idea is that people wander through that environment and they spend time with it. You know, they don't go through and tick the box and go on a circuit, but they can sit and lie in the bioengineered forest and fall asleep or read a book. Um, you know, they can inhabit um, and try on these strange prosthetic garments that Bart Hess is developing. They can sit and watch our short film. Um, that they can actually really engage with this space. And um, a lot of the projects that come up, the Marshmallow Laser Feast that Memo is um, kind enough to join us here, is developing is all about 
Uh, we, we had a meeting about it yesterday, so I don't know where it really got to be, but, um, uh, so I could be stepping all over his toes, but it, you know, the idea is that, it, that, it, that it's implicit in the idea of interaction and, and engagement. So I think to create it as a stage set or as an environment is the way that we're describing, and, and I'm art directing with Vincenzo and Natalie, who um, is the film director that did Cube and Splice. So the idea was not to, to work with an exhibition designer or to do it myself, but to have a filmmaker they could help to construct a cinematic experience to put people in these contexts and force them to start to um, have conversations and start to start to share their own stories about what the future city may be or how they respond to it or how they feel about it. So I think that's um, uh, something that's, that's really important to us to move into. Because, I mean, it started off <coughs> to, to think about it like, uh, I'm starting to get really into LARPing. I've never done a laugh. <laughs> I don't know if anyone in this room has done a laugh, but I'm kind of intrigued by that. Like, I want to do an, an, an unknown fields expedition that actually doesn't travel anywhere at all, that's in a big warehouse in Sussex or something. And the, the place we travel to is a fictional one. And we work with um, LARPers and we actually design and script an imaginary place. And we never actually travel anywhere, but um, we just travel through the fiction, mm -hmm. right? So I think. That that's a really interesting space to work. Another form of travel, um, or another form of engagement, isn't it? just about going to a place and meeting people out in these locations, but it's actually speculating on um, constructing a world in other ways. You know? So maybe there's scope for you to work with those people from Greenpeace who are on that panel. If you make the photo of the uh, the bird direction or an experience that people have to you know, have and make decisions about yeah. what they can do with this oil soil. Yeah, maybe, maybe. Um, I mean, the laugh, yeah, the laughs are interesting in terms of their way that they engage uh, an audience. I mean, I have a friend, um, uh, Ella Seder, who, who does lots of laughing um, in the north. I don't know why the, the, the north, um, like Scandinavian countries, are the laughing centers of the world. It says something about the climate or context that they have to invent fictions somehow in order to cope. But um, she tells, I can't, I can't not really remember it, but, but I'm paraphrasing. So she tells a story of, you know, people that went into this to this story, which was about, I think it was about <coughs> nuclear fallout or something, or some kind of nuclear apocalypse, and they were trapped in this bunker, and they had to decide who would live and who would die. Um, and it was a harrowing two or three day experience. And so some people walked in being kind of gun-toting, NRA, um, right-wing, uh, political-leaning people, and they walked out being you know, anti-nuke activists, right? Like. There's something interesting about living these things in the way that living, living these fictions in the way that you describe, which I think is really intriguing. Um, I mean, I, I was uh, on on the last summer expedition. I was actually supposed to write a piece that I never did because I was in Burning Man Festival um, uh, about um, the Occupy movement as a form of fiction prototyping. Um, uh, I mean, it, it's kind of something that. As an architect, it's one of the most interesting things that happen, that's happened in the discipline in the last, in the last decade, I think. Um, and we talk about it as, as um, uh, you know, similar to a LARP, it was a form of prototyping a future, right? It, it, there wasn't an explicit... Um, uh, the, the currency of the movement was about the conversations that took place in the libraries that formed in, in semi-public spaces of the city, you know? It was about prototyping a way of thinking and living and, and, and a dialogue outside to, outside of the, the typical means of capital. So um, I think that, you know, it's certainly something that we're, that we're intrigued by is you know, this move um, towards engagement and dialogue um, and really intriguing ways. Yeah. Maybe the best moment for engagement and dialogue will be socially afterwards. So. Um, <laughs> On that note, please uh, help me thank Liam very much for that amazing talk.